God had fought for him. You see, David fought a bear and then it died. And then David fought a lion and it died. And because of him knowing the faithfulness of his God, he was able to step up to the giant and say, I see you, I know you. In the same way the bear came down and in the same way the lion came down, in the same way you're coming down. This is the Slaying Giants podcast. Hey friends, welcome back. This is episode three, Down Goes the Giant. And we are finally going to talk about the story that this whole podcast was named after, David and Goliath. This is one of those stories just like the prodigal son in the Bible. We covered that on week one. Everybody knows it. Even if you haven't been to church in a long time, even if you've only been to church a couple of times, even if you've never been to church at all, if you have never opened up your Bible, you have probably heard the story of David and Goliath or at least a Hollywood version of it. David and Goliath is the classic underdog story. Boy faces a giant. Um, team who's never won before faces uh, the champions and somehow they become the champions. Everybody loves a good underdog story. And I think that we can all relate to having to face a situation that is much bigger than we are at least one time in our lives. Today, we have so much to unpack with this story that we're not even going to be able to touch everything that I want to touch on or talk about um, that God has showed me. But we're going to squeeze in as much as we can. So let's get started. This story is found in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 17 through 58. So sorry, it's going to be a long one. Hang in with me. It's going to be worth it, I promise. And as usual, I'm going to be reading out of the ESV, but feel free to use whatever Bible you're most comfortable in to follow along. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Ezekiah in Ephes the men. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up the line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley in between them. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. And he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our, our, you shall be our servants and you will serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of an Ephratite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three eldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to battle, and the names of the three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him was Abinadab, and the third was Shammah, probably. I mean, that's probably how you pronounce it. Who knows? David was the youngest, and the eldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For forty days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, Take your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also, take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. Now, Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. 
And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with him, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard them. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who get, kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the man who stood near him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now, Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know the presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but just a word? And he turned away, or he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has come, or he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand. And he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods, with a little G, not a big G. That's important. Then the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. 
When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell to his face on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shariam as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, Inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Woo, what a story. Long story, a lot of talking, a lot of blood. Y'all, I could literally sit here for the rest of the day and just unpack the treasure trove of information from this story, just like one after another. I could talk to you about the significance of David picking up five stones. I could talk to you about the significance of Saul's armor. I could talk to you about the significance of um, David only using one stone out of five. I could talk to you about the fact that the condition of the stones were smooth and what it took to get to that point. There's, there's so many directions that you can go from the story of David and Goliath. There are literally hundreds of messages and sermons that you could pick right out of the story even though this story is told all of the time there are so many unique messages that you can get out of it and that is literally scraping the top of the barrel that's not even digging into the meat of the story but because I don't have time to go into everything the Lord's given me a few things that he wants you all to really think about so Let's start with something amazing. The way that David trained to fight Goliath. And I know what you're saying. I know what you're thinking. Now, Em, that story was really long. And yes, you caught me. Like, I may have zoned out like a time or two or like three. Because I know the story of David and Goliath. And I didn't have to listen the whole time. Because I had my, I had my good listening ears on. And so I didn't have to listen to every word you said. But I know that even though I zoned out, there is nowhere in there that talks about David hitting the gym and training to face Goliath. Like, I know it's not in there. Well, what I'm going to tell you is, did you look at verses 34, 35, and 36? Because David looks at King Saul when King Saul is like, I just don't think that you're equipped to fight Goliath. Um, you're a child, basically. Um, he looks at King Saul and he said, I keep my father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear dares to try to take one of the flock, I chase them down and I fight them. I have struck down lions and bears. David literally fought actual lions and bears. And he won. He brought his lamb back to the flock. And it is because of that very training of fighting the lions and the bears that David knew that he could face Goliath because all he needed was the memory of the victory and the memory of the previous victories through God's hand to remind him of the powerful God that he serves. I read a post the other day from Jackie Hill Perry that says this, I just watched a documentary on memory. In it, people who have lost their memory 
have a hard time describing their future. Not being able to remember somehow hinders their imagination. No wonder God continually beckons us to remember what he's done. Our very hope rests on it. And God is no stranger to this very concept in the Bible. He's continually telling the Israelites to remember. Remember the rainbow, how I'm never going to flood the earth again. Remember the Passover, where the angel of death literally passed over you. Remember the stone stack by the Jordan when I allowed you to cross. He even told them to sew tassels on their garments to remember his commandments. And from this, we can determine two very important things, two very important truths. Number one, we are very fickle and forgetful people. And number two, there is a very real and present power in remembering God's faithfulness. David knew that he could face Goliath, not because he was a warrior, Up until this point of David's life, David's whole resume consisted of being a shepherd and keeping sheep and playing a harp for Saul. That was David's entire resume. Yes, he had already been anointed king, but that don't even matter right now because Saul's still the king. His entire resume consisted of keeping sheep and playing a harp. Not not warrior material. David had not been trained to be a warrior. He'd never been trained to be a soldier. He was still essentially a child. He was a teenager. But because David remembered God's faithfulness, he knew that one time a bear came up and took a lamb. And he went after that bear and he struck the bear and he killed it. And he knew that one time a lion came up and he took a lamb. And he went and he found the lion and he got his lamb and he killed the lion. And because of the memory of God helping him fight those battles against the bear and the lion, he knew that Goliath would be no different. Y'all, the power in the remembrance of God's faithfulness wasn't just for the shepherd boy. It's for us too. When we remember who God is, when we remember what he's done and what he's brought us from, when we remember that as Christians, God has literally delivered us from hell, both the literal hell and the one of our own creation. How can we fear any giant that decides to stand up and try to block out our son? Because of what God has done for us, we can face anything. And it's not because uh, we've leveled up in any way or we're great or we're powerful. It's because, like David, God trains us and equips us to fight big battles with his help. God couldn't let David just fight Goliath if he hadn't already taught him to trust him by sending bears and lions his way. Likewise, God allows storms to come our way to teach us how to swim. He has to grow our muscles. He has to train us up. He can't just throw us out into the deep and expect us to make it. He knows that our legs are going to get tired. There are so many days, like every single day I, when I'm praying, I pray to God to take me to the deep end. That is always my prayer. I'm like, God, just get me, get me in the deep. Get me into the middle of you. Get me into the thickness of your presence. Like I want to be in the deepest part that I can go. I want to be in the deep end of faith. And I'm praying and I'm like, give me gifts. Give me, give me whatever. Give me whatever you can. I want everything that you can give me. Like I literally want everything that you can give me. Take me to the deep end. And I'm asking him to let me do these things and to learn these things. But God can't just throw me into the deep end because he knows that there's sharks out there. Yes, there are spiritual gifts that you may want, but are you trained to fight the spiritual opposition you're going to face? Yes, you may want to preach or teach or do a podcast, but has God trained you to go toe to toe? with any demonic spirits who are going to come against you to try to get you to quit your calling or to damage your testimony. God knows there are sharks in the deep end. He knows that once you decide to stand up for him and share his gospel, you're essentially drawing a target on your forehead. Without training from storms, even as difficult as the storms are at the time, without lions and bears, Without the remembrance of the faithfulness of God, we'll drown or get eaten every single time. 
And this leads me to my second point. And I wonder how many of you caught this when we were reading through the text. This may have been one of the parts you zoned out. I don't know. The Israelites, like this battle is taking place in the Valley of Eglah. The Israelites are on one side of the valley on the mountainside. And the Philistines have set up their camp on the other side of the valley on the mountainside. So in between the two armies, there is a valley to separate them. And every single day, Goliath walks out, probably into the valley, and he shouts to the Israelite side of the camp and says, send someone down to fight me. If you win, we will be your slaves. That sounds great, right? Yeah, a bunch of free slaves. Cool. But if you lose, you will be our slaves and you will serve us. And the Israelites were afraid and they had good reason to be. And this went on every single day for 40 days, which, oh gosh, guys, the significance of that. But we don't even have time to unpack that, so let's just keep on going. You're going to have to look that up for yourself. As long as Israel stayed on their mountain, they were safe. In order to fight Goliath, David had to go into the valley. And the Bible says in verse 48 that David ran quickly. I love that. I can't, I can't. How many of us are willing to run quickly toward the valley when we're safe on the mountain? The Israelites probably were not happy on the mountainside. I mean, probably they wanted to be at home with their families, not waiting to face the Philistines in battle. They probably were uncomfortable. They had been there for like 40 days. But for over a month, they were safe on the mountain. It doesn't matter how high the mountains we climb. It doesn't matter the height of our success. It doesn't matter the height of the goodness. It doesn't matter how good things are. Everything, every mountain ends. Everything has to come to an end. Every mountain ends. And the valley must be faced again. Unless we become complacent and stop moving forward. Only then can we say, Can we stay safe on our mountain? But rest assured, sweet friends, that the longer that we stay out of the will of God and on our mountains, the more uncomfortable that mountain is going to become to us. The Israelites were safe on the mountain, but the mountain was uncomfortable. They wanted to go home. They wanted to be at home with their families, but they couldn't be at home with their families until they faced the Philistines who were on the other side of the valley. If they just retreated and went home, The Philistines would have just came and attacked them and killed them. Like, they had to face the Philistine army, and they were stuck on that mountain. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't couldn't move. They were frozen. I say that to say this, because for some of us, the idea of facing our next valley, our next giant, is so scary and so daunting that we refuse to budge. But in doing so, Are we not telling God that our giant is greater than he is? And in doing so, are we not revealing the true beliefs of our hearts? Do we even trust God really? Do we trust God to be faithful even though he's already proven himself time and time again, not only in his word, but also in our lives? Do we even trust him? We sing, we go to church and we start singing these songs, these amazing and powerful and uplifting songs. And I have nothing against these songs, but we sing these songs and we're saying the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. He's the same God. He never changes. Um, When things go wrong, he makes them right. But do we truly believe that? Are we living our lives like we believe that? God is calling us to check our hearts. He's asking us to trust him, to lead us, even through the valley of the shadow of death. And he tells us that we can fear no evil. I wonder if David penned this line in remembrance of this very valley. My last point for today before we wrap up is this. Be careful of the people you allow in your circle. There were a lot of people speaking to David in this story, and none of them were particularly helpful. Saul meant well by telling David to wear his armor, but Saul was actually doing David more harm than good. Saul was a big man. The Bible tells us that he was chosen to be king because he stood head and shoulders above the crowd. 
David was still a young teenager. He wasn't big or strong or muscly like Saul. The armor didn't fit or work for David because it wasn't meant for David. And that is a whole sermon. It, didn't, it wasn't made for David. Likewise, we have to watch out for people who mean well, but speak things and give advice to us that was not meant for us by God. A good rule of thumb is this. If what someone is telling you goes against what God is specifically speaking to your heart or what is written specifically in your Bible, you need to be wary of what they're saying. Another person that we need to be uh, on the watch out for in our lives um, that is in David's story is David's own brother Eliab. If you don't remember, like from the story, Eliab said to David, what are you even doing here, David? And who's watching dad's sheep? I know, I know the presumption of your heart and the evil. You just wanted to see the battle. You're just down here to snoop and get your nose in our business. You're just wanting to see the blood. Y'all, we all know a person just like Eliab. You don't belong here. Do you honestly think that you're equipped to do this job? You're not welcome here. You're not important enough to be here. Eliab even degrades David's job as a shepherd. He said, who's watching those few sheep in the wilderness? And I don't know if y'all understand where all this snark and... Um, rudeness is coming from from Eliab but it's probably coming from the fact that just a couple chapters earlier in this uh, story of David Eliab is passed over for king as the eldest son like it probably you know it should have been him but it was David that was anointed to be the next king of Israel like the rejection of that like Eliab is carrying that you know what I mean and you can't tell me that there's not a sore place in his heart for David. There's not jealousy for David there because David was anointed over seven brothers that were more qualified by standards of the world and the standards of Israel to be the king than David was. You can't tell me that there's not a sore spot there because if you have siblings, like, you know, you know, you're fighting for attention. Now... Here David is on the battlefield. Not only has he taken away Eliab's chance to be the king, here he is on the battlefield telling Eliab, who is trained as a soldier and a warrior of Saul, how to do his job. Like the nerve of this punk kid, right? And he's sitting here and he's criticizing. And if you have a younger sibling, maybe you're going to understand where Eliab is coming from right here. I just, ooh, like it just grates on you. He's sitting here and he's criticizing that nobody's walked down into the valley to face this nine-foot giant waiting to pulverize the first idiot dumb enough to go down there. I mean, because we all know that's what Goliath is going to do, right? Um, a five-foot man, even a six-foot man facing a nine-foot man or even closer to 10 feet, like, that is that is not a fair matchup. We, we know that. It's a death trap. To Eliab, David's just down there rubbing his nose all in everybody's business, telling everybody how to do what they're supposed to be doing. David's not even doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to be watching the sheep. And he doesn't know that Jesse, his father, has sent David down there with provisions because David's son left them with the person who's keeping all that, and now David's just down here busybodying. Eliab knew what was at stake, and he's probably a little irked that David's even down there because David keeps on asking, what, what happens to the person that kills the, the giant? What happens to the man who uh, defeats this uncircumcised Philistine who's defying the army of the God? Because he keeps on asking about this reward, and I mean, what's David going to do about it? Go down there with his harp and sing him to death? Like, is David going to go down there and fight him? Eliab knows what's at stake. First of all, it's going to be the life of the man who decides to walk into the valley. And second of all, it's going to be the lives of the Israelites when that man gets 
killed by Goliath because they're going to have to be slaves to the Philistines. And I'm telling you about Eliab in this moment for two reasons. One, there's going to be people who try to deter you from God's calling on your life. They don't understand the full story. Maybe they're jealous. I don't know. There's going to be people who try to deter you from God's calling, though. They're going to insult you. They're going to put you down. They're going to tell you that you're not good enough, that God can't use you, that your past is too dirty, that you didn't do things right. Uh, You should have done them this way. It doesn't follow along with this. It doesn't follow along with church beliefs. There's there's too much. You've done too much. You can't. God's not going to use you. For whatever reason, God can't use you to do this. They're going to try to deter you from that calling. And I hate to tell you this. It breaks my heart to have to even say this. That person, seven times out of ten, is usually going to come from an older more equipped Christian. Eliab was more equipped in every way to fight Goliath. He was a soldier. He had been trained for it. He was big. He was tall. He was muscular. It tells us that earlier when David was anointed as king, that he looked and he said, I know that this oldest son is going to be the next king of Israel because he is tall and handsome. You know what I'm saying? But God said, no, 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 no. That is not the next king of Israel. Do not look on the man's outward appearance because I don't look at that. I look at his heart. Eliab is more equipped from the outside. He has armor, or at least he has a sword. He is big and he's tall. But, and here's why reason number two is so important. Eliab didn't move. Not the first time that Goliath came out and taunted the Israelites. Not the second time. Not the eighth time, or the twentieth, or the fiftieth time. In fact... Eliab listened for 40 days and 40 nights as Goliath came out and taunted the Israelites. He jeered at them. He disrespected Eliab's people and Eliab's God. And Eliab remained on the mountainside instead of running into the valley. Eliab is annoyed because he knows David's coming down here and criticizing that Goliath has sat here and defied God and he is saying awful things about God and he is making fun of the army of God and he is defying the army of the living God. That's what David keeps saying. But Eliab's listened to it for 40 days. He could probably recite the speech by heart. Eliab has had 80 chances to do what David is getting ready to do on his first opportunity. And that has got to be a sore spot. Y'all, do not be like Eliab. Don't wait and wait and put God off and then be upset when he stops asking you to do something and gives it to someone else and lets them receive your victory and your blessing. Don't be jealous of someone else's obedience. It doesn't help and it only chokes out any good left in your heart. Instead, ask God for forgiveness and ask for another opportunity to run into the valley and face the giant. Okay. Now that we've talked about all of that, let's find our red thread and tie this story to Jesus. In this story, Goliath is obviously a mirror for sin, right? For the devil, for sin, for the whole conglomeration, Goliath is a mirror for sin. And David is obviously a mirror for us, right? We got to go down there and we got to face the giant. Wrong. David is a mirror for Jesus. What? And you may be asking, who are we? Okay, because we're in the story somewhere, right? Yeah, we are. Um, Do you remember the Israelites who are sitting on the mountainside, literally shaking in their sandals? That's the mirror for us. Embarrassing, right? But I want you to look at this story, and I want you to see this as empowering. We can't be David because Jesus has to be David. We can't face the giant and kill it because we're just people. We're people and we're sinful and it doesn't matter what we do. The very best of us is still filthy rags to God. If we go down there and face the giant, 
the giant's going to pulverize us. And I know that everybody preaches the story of David and Goliath as the big underdog story and that we can face our giants. And we most certainly can face our giants, but we need Jesus to face the giant for us. Just as David ran to face Goliath in the valley, so did Jesus Christ come and face the giant of sin, hell, death, and the grave. And y'all, he stomped them good. Just as Saul asked David his qualifications, so does Jesus remind us. He tends to his father's sheep. Y'all, that's us. And he kills any lion or bear that tries to devour them. Just as David cut off the giant's head with Goliath's own sword, so also did Jesus defeat sin with its own weapon, death. Y'all, there is a truer and better David. There is a truer and better Bethlehemite. There's a truer and better giant slayer. Just as David slayed Goliath to save the Israelites from a life of slavery to the Philistines, so did Jesus come to save us from a life of slavery and from the punishment of sin. The punishment for sin is death and separation from God. And Jesus willingly went to the cross and emptied the cup of wrath from God that he was saving just for our punishment, punishment that we deserved. The Philistines may not have deserved to be slaves to the Philistines. Did I say that right? The Israelites may not have deserved to be slaves to the Philistines. That's what I meant. But we definitely deserved the punishment for our sins. And Jesus willingly went to the cross and emptied that cup out so that we didn't have to face it. If that doesn't encourage y'all today, I don't know what will. But I'm going to drop one more little nugget on you before we get off here. God needs people. No, I'm going to say that again. God wants people, just like you and me, to tell the stories of his goodness and of his faithfulness. He wants us to tell the stories of our slain giants. He needs us to be open and vulnerable and to share our past and share what he saved us from. Not so that we can be boastful in our own righteousness, but so that we can point to the one who really put our giant down. We have to make a choice today. Will we receive the praise for our victories, or will we reflect the praise to Jesus? Because y'all, everyone has a giant, but not everyone has Jesus. And who better to help point them in the right direction than us, the ones set free by the person who came and killed our giant? Y'all, one dead giant means that all giants die. And that is something to be extra thankful about today. See you next time.